This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We welcome you to this May 2nd edition of Real Talk. Ryan Jesperson, John Hicks, on a beautiful Tuesday in our hometown of Edmonton, Alberta. A little bit later on in the show, we're going to be meeting a couple of folks associated with and, and of course, dedicating a great deal of their resources to, as we tweeted about, in our neck of the woods, one of the Edmonton area's only, or the Edmonton area's only 24-hour crisis prevention shelter for infants and children. How much do you know about Kids Cottage? We're going to talk about that and to them today. Plus, a political brouhaha. Do I call it that, John? Is that too bombastic in our promotion of our leadoff guests this morning? I don't know. Please don't. I mean, it is election season, and, and, and this one's going to be partisan. There's no doubt about that, and there's absolutely nothing wrong about that. We're going to talk to two senior advisors on the UCP and NDP campaigns, Erica Barutis and uh, Cheryl Oates will join us and, and we'll talk about, I'm sure in very reasonable fashion, what both of them think about the other party's platform. And we'll be looking to our live tuning audience. We're going to take a look at the live stream uh, to see what you have to say, Real Talkers. That's one of the great reasons to join us live on our YouTube channel every morning when we're doing this show at 8.30 Mountain Time. You can also catch us on the live streaming Mixler audio app. But of course, everybody today, it seems like across Canada, at least millions of people at the water coolers and the coffee machines are on their morning Zoom calls are going to be talking about a loss that I think is fair to say is being felt across the country, mm -hmm. across generations. Uh, the loss, the passing at 84 years of age of Canadian icon, uh, crooner. Uh, folk music legend Gordon Lightfoot, uh, his publicist confirming that he passed away at a Toronto hospital Monday evening. That was uh, last night. The cause of death not immediately available. And and this is one that it seems like, Johnny, you know, 25, 30 year olds and 85 year olds are both feeling. Yeah, I think we're all feeling it. Do you have a favorite uh, Lightfoot song? Oh, you and I were kind of we, we were kind of talking mm -hmm. back and forth about this. And I feel like it's my answer's. A little bit too lazy because it's just such an obvious one. But when I hear if you could read my mind, <laughs> yeah, and, I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. it's just so. His, there's something about his voice that's just next level. Mm -hmm. Do you have one? Is there one that like takes you back to a certain time in your life or or puts you somewhere contextually? I, I like all his his songs about rain, like rainy day people, early morning rain. You throw that on on a yeah. on a lazy Sunday, and he would just. You know, Karun you to sleep. Yeah, a absolute legend uh, whose, uh, you know, uh, career it speaks for itself. And, of course, a Hall of Famer and, and uh, you know, someone that uh, was once described by Rush legend himself, Getty Lee. Uh, this in a 2019 documentary is Canada's Poet Laureate. He said he is our iconic singer-songwriter, which is pretty high praise and I think probably a pretty accurate statement when you look at how people feel about him. Uh, he was a success in Canada. He was a, a success, of course, around the world. And uh, I don't know if this is a, a, a param you know, sort of like a, a measuring stick for anything, John, but his songs covered as well by a lot of legends in their own right. Mm -hmm. You know, Bob Dylan, uh, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Stompin' Tom, Liza Minnelli, Barbara Streisand, uh, Sarah McLaughlin, Anne Murray, all mm -hmm. of them covering Gordon Lightfoot songs. And he, he once said in an interview that he didn't dislike any of the covers of his songs that he heard. Which uh -oh. was, there you go. Everybody dodged a bullet. Big inspiration to Canadian artists, too. Bare Naked Ladies, first album. Gordon, named after him. So, yeah. For sure. And we're hearing from Canadians across the country, including the Prime Minister, uh, who tweeted just a short time ago, says we've lost one of our greatest singer-songwriters. Gordon Lightfoot captured our country's spirit in his music, and in doing so, he helped shape Canada's soundscape. You know, may his music continue to inspire future generations. His legacy live on forever. Uh, the prime minister goes on from there. I, I saw this from Jan Arden earlier this morning. Uh, said this songwriter, pardon me, this was last night. This songwriter truly walked among the greatest. His songs woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. We all know the words, even if we don't think we do. That's such a good way to put it. She says, what a legacy you leave behind. Steady on. Gordon Lightfoot and then a lot of journalists as well uh, noticing even just you know within our circle 
We're seeing a lot of people post uh, photos with the legend and to talk mm-hmm. about their personal memories and in interviewing him, which I thought was really neat as well. Ian Hannah Mansing, of course, uh, one, of, one of the big deals over at the National uh, at CBC talking about in early 2020 when he had a, an opportunity to spend a day with Gordon Lightfoot and just talk about his collection of art that had been inspired by the Edmund Fitzgerald um, Lightfoot said that was his greatest tune, by the way. That was his. Mm. He, he figured that was the best song that he ever wrote. And I saw this one from from Tara Sloan as well, formerly the co-host of Hometown Hockey with Ron McLean, talking about meeting Lightfoot at his Toronto home and, and just the huge impact that he had on them. So, uh, yeah, obviously kind of an, a next level type of Canadian personality. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the country will feel that loss. And, and, and one of the things I have to say, um, you know, in, in a circumstance like this is that all of the buzz and all of the talk and all of the reminiscing and, you know, the national broadcaster is promising specials for the next few days. It will spur an interest in his music. And I bet you a lot of people um, that, you know, through no fault of their own, Mm -hmm. some of the younger members of our population are probably going to hear a Gordon Lightfoot tune for the first time this week. Yeah. And this is is pretty cool. This is what we see now when old artists, young artists, no matter when they pass away, iTunes, they shoot up on the charts. So, yeah, you can uh, send us your thoughts on on Gordon Lightfoot and his legacy, but your favorite tune and, and maybe, you know, what he meant or what he means to you. Dwayne is watching us live on YouTube right now, says he saw Gordon Lightfoot live front row center. What? In Edmonton, he says in 2010, says I met him and his band after the show. Wow. Dwayne, that's where the story needs to start. What happened next? Tell us in a follow up. Yeah, Sharon says, my late sister could sing the hell out of Gordon Lightfoot. So Sharon's remembering her sister today. How beautiful is that? You know, a lot of people talking about that Bare Naked Ladies album, that tune there. And and of course, we'll continue to, to read the comments that you have here uh, for us. You can use the hashtag RealTalkRJ as well. Uh, let's get political in a second, but first we'll let you know that this episode of Real Talk is presented by our friends at Danatech. Danatech is safety training done right your partner of choice for all of your health and safety training needs. And they're going to be at the Energy Safety Conference in Banff today. I want to be at a conference in Banff today. (laughs) That's where Danatech's going to be there at Booth 48. And so if you happen to be listening to us on Mixler as you're making your way out to the Rockies, if you're on your way to Banff, swing by Booth 48 at the Energy Safety Conference. Say hi to their team and enter their prize draw. You can learn more about how you can keep your teams safe and your business compliant With training designed by leading experts in the field, Danatech is your reliable safety partner with a track record of trust. Get your team trained starting today at Danatech.com. Well, if it wasn't for Gordon Lightfoot, Alberta's election kickoff would have been leading the headlines in provinces even outside our own. It's because obviously Alberta's a province of with a great deal of interest around it, and pundits from across the country are expecting a hard-fought election. You will not find a pollster that's willing to go on the record right now, four weeks out from election day, and predict who's going to win it. This one's tight, and we're grateful that our next two guests have agreed to join us for what we know will be a spirited exchange of ideas and a critical analysis of each other's party's policies. Erica Barudis is the founding president of the United Conservative Party. She served as Premier Daniel Smith's principal secretary, and she's now down, uh, I believe, Erica, correct me if I'm wrong, in Calgary as a senior advisor on the UCP campaign. Calgary's going to be a big deal down there. Uh, we also say good morning and hello to Cheryl Oates. She was the uh, Premier Rachel Notley's uh, Director of Communications, and she's now a senior advisor working on the NDP campaign. Uh, Erica, on your Instagram, you posted a few days ago, you basically had your entire closet unloaded because you've moved your entire life down to Calgary, and the reason's probably pretty obvious. This is where the election, everybody assumes, is going to be won or lost. Absolutely. I mean, I think Cheryl and I will be uh, hoteling for the next uh, at least 28 days. Um, you know, it's coming down to to Calgary. I think that's where the most undecided voters are. Um, obviously, the NDP has a pretty strong, uh, big stronghold in Edmonton and, and has for a long time. Doesn't mean we're not going to 
going to fight there as, as much as we can. Uh, and, and we kind of um, have rural on our side. So I think it's going to come down to Calgary. It's going to come down to who can best manage the economy, uh, who is the best leader for our future of getting investment here, creating jobs. And uh, I think that's exactly what Calgary wants to see. And that's what we're going to be campaigning on for the next 28 days. Uh, Cheryl, what, what Erica just said is what I have often uh, just said and what a lot of people just say. And I know that that people like you on this NDP campaign are endeavoring to prove us wrong. And we, we just sort of look at the demographic and we look at the track record of, of how regions vote and we say Edmonton's going NDP and the rural's going to vote UCP and then it's all going to be up to Calgarians to, to determine how this plays out. And I bet in the back of your mind you're going, want to bet? Like you've not just written <laughs> off rural Alberta, have you? Absolutely not. And I don't think that most Albertans would like outside of Calgary and Edmonton. It's a pretty diverse province. And certainly, yes, the NDP has a strong hold on Edmonton. The NDP is incredibly competitive in Calgary and you will see Rachel Notley in Calgary a lot. But we are also really competitive outside the city. Uh, outside the two major cities. We're competitive in play in smaller centers like Lethbridge. Um, we're certainly competitive in places like Banff, Kananaskis, and we have a very, very strong campaign uh, up further north, especially in those seats surrounding Edmonton that we colloquially call the donut. Uh, so I think that to say it all comes down to Battleground Calgary is a bit of an exaggeration, although there will be a ton of focus in Calgary. Um, I think there's lots of seat to be, seats to be won outside the two cities as okay, well. Okay, I know I've said this to both of you off camera, I, I, but yeah, feel free to jump in. Erica, go ahead. You knew where I was going with that. Um, so I love that Cheryl highlighted the diversity of our, our rural, um, you know, urbans. So kind of the smaller centers as well as, you know, the, the complete rural kind of more remote areas. The one thing that they can all agree on is that Bill 6 that Rachel Notley said a few days ago um, is the biggest attack on, on farmers, folks, family farms, uh, the generational groups that uh, put food on our table. So I think, uh, you know, Cheryl can try as hard as she wants as NDP, but when, when Rachel Notley came out with come, bringing back Bill 6, um, it honestly, you know, was, was, I was smiling. Um, I can't believe that they would do that to rural Alberta, especially when, uh, they want to try to get them, uh, back in the fold when it comes to places like Lethbridge. Um, I think, you know, this is a party that wants to give out free drugs and doesn't want to help people with safe injection sites, or sorry, they want safe injection sites. Um, and they're going to charge people $40 a day to get recovery. So, you know, places okay. like Lethbridge that have seen a lot of that, I'm very interested to see how they're going to, they're going to fix, fix what they've so done in the past. Cheryl. This is this an interesting example. Like, let's look two things here that I think is really obvious. And this isn't the first time Erica and I are kind of like head to head on a bunch of panels and Erica always goes straight at bill six. And it's because it's two things that I want to say about this. One is the UCP is desperate to talk about anything, but the things that matter to people. People are talking about healthcare right now. We're talking about protecting healthcare. The UCP is talking about you paying to see a family doctor. They do not want to talk about that. So anything that can pull the message off of healthcare, they desperately want to talk about. But let's talk about bill six since we're you brought it up. Alberta. I think it's a really, really great example of the difference between the UCP and the NDP. We are willing to say we made a mistake. The rollout of Bill 6 sucked. We did not do a good job of it, and we owned that, and we did our very best to fix it. And what we can say now is that absolutely everybody agrees that protecting the lifestyle and the, the way that family farms operate and live is absolutely important, and we will protect that. But we will also say at the same time that it is important that workers in Alberta, no matter what sector they're working in, are treated fairly. And I don't think that any Albertan will argue with that. Erica? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump in. So, you know, if we want to talk about healthcare, and then I'd love to talk about the economy, because I think that is something that every Albertan would want to talk about. And same with healthcare. Um, you know, the NDP has been spinning that you'll have to pay to see a family doctor, fear mongering Albertans that that's spinning. what's going to happen. Your leader said it. Well, okay, so look, look at this. If you sign a deal with the federal government, which our government premier Daniel Smith did for $24 billion to come into this province, it's actually not allowed within the act to have people pay for a family doctor. So it's it's not fair that you say that. And it's actually wrong. I didn't say it. Daniel Smith has said it over and over again. She has detailed it. She has publicly mused about it. All we've done is make sure that people are aware of it. And a week ago, she she signed a deal a month ago and a couple of weeks ago made a public health guarantee. So if we're going to take people on their words. Today, no, I which remember I'm sure the last time she made that. a guarantee. 
2012, she made a public guarantee. Nobody else will cross the floor. And three weeks later, she took her whole caucus across. So I'm not sure that people should put a lot of stake in Daniel Smith's public guarantees. Erica, well, you talked about... Logically, what do you what you know? <laughs> well, well, no, go on. Let me, I want to let Can you I make a point. Time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was going to say, 2015, I mean, Rachel also campaigned on, on you know, didn't mention a carbon tax. So if you want to talk about trusting or seeing, you know, understanding where people are coming from, she came, didn't campaign, didn't mention it, and then all of a sudden introduced a carbon tax. So I think if we're going to go through the facts of, of what these people have done as their record, we should probably highlight that one for Albertans too. Cheryl, you want to respond to that? No. Yeah, I think that like we did not run on a carbon tax in 2015. We ran on a plan to bring in a, a plan to address climate change and a plan to address emissions. And that was what experts recommended to us as the, as the best way to uh, meet those goals. And, and and governments do have to develop policy throughout four years. I mean, they introduce a platform and then they have to work with the public. They have to work with experts. They have to work with those who work in the sectors to know how to move forward over four years because a platform can only guide so much. Did we get everything right throughout our four years in government? Absolutely not. But like I said, the difference between the UCP and the NDP is as when we've uh, misstepped or we've made mistakes, we've owned it. We are going to uh, so take exactly what you said, though, take exactly what you just said about learning, being educated, being in a leadership role and maybe changing what you had said in the past. Then that's exactly what Danielle Smith did, too. She had maybe said that Daniel in the past, Smith doesn't mean the same thing in the morning. Daniel Smith doesn't mean the same thing. She can say something in the morning and she doesn't mean it by the end of the day. That is a much different thing than developing policy as you sit in government. I don't agree with that. I think that's more of a character attack than factual. But I do think, you know, you've got to, what I think, Ryan, is important. Um, Cheryl and I can do this all day. And at the end of the day, we'll have a beer. Like, it's not a it's not an issue. But um, I, think what, uh, I think the biggest thing is these are actually two, two individuals that have a track record. And that Albertans can look at what they did as premier um, and what their their parties did in government. And I think that's an actually it's a unique situation that we're seeing when what the election is. And it's going to come down to track record. And I do think the economy is one of those those big issues that people want to make sure their government is staying out of the way so they can be strong business operators um, and bring investment, but also that they you know are, are going to create opportunities as well. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about the economy. Obviously, we're going to talk about the Calgary's arena deal and a couple of other things. But Eric, I want to circle back to something you you, you mentioned, and, and I want to give you a chance to elaborate on the UCP plan to address the opioid crisis. Uh, to be honest and to speak frankly, it's not going to be at the top of a lot of people's so-called list of priorities of what they would ask candidates at the door. But there will be thousands of Alberta families that that would be the only question they care about because they've lost somebody or they're afraid they're going to lose somebody that they care about. It's uh, across the country a full-blown crisis, and, and even the public is divided on how to address it and what measures we should take or where funding should go. But a lot of the expert voices agree that things like supervised consumption services do work, that things like safe supply are worth looking into. Obviously, the UCP position, at least as introduced by you today, is that it's looked at as giving people free drugs, so it begs the fair question of what's the UCP's plan to address the opioid crisis in Alberta? Yeah, and I think the opioid crisis and, you know, dealing with recovery and mental health is also part of this public safety issue that we're all seeing. So to your point, Ryan, fortunately, not every Albertan has to deal with, um, you know, going through recovery or having a family member um, either lose their life or deal with addictions. Uh, but what I think a lot of Albertans are dealing with right now is public safety. And we're seeing a lot of this firsthand downtown of people with um, addictions and what our party and the government has also done is look at this holistically. We've tried a lot of things in the past of, you know, uh, safe injection sites, affordable housing, putting people up in hotels um, to try and give them the opportunity to recover. And, and as a silo, they're not working. So the United Conservative Party is taking a holistic approach, um, one for the address uh, to address public safety, but also looking at, you know, compassionate intervention, looking to give people an opportunity to um, get strong and supportive recovery so that they can, you know, as most people want to be reinstituted into society and be a contributor. Cheryl, what would the NDP do differently than what the United Conservative government has done over the past four years on that file on the opioid crisis? 
Well, I think what's probably most worth talking about is the UCP's most recent plan to force people into treatment. I think what, what we've said all along is that there isn't a one-stop fix for this. Like, absolutely, Erica, I agree with you. Public safety plays a role in this, but it's not a one-fit-all when, uh, when we look at people struggling with addiction and, and the way that we recover, way that we help them recover from addiction uh, while still supporting the community. So I think what what is most different is the the most recent public musing about using legislation to force those dealing with addictions into treatment. Erica, this Calgary Arena deal, I, I, depending on the people you talk about, I mean, yesterday, even on our show, we have this Alberta politics super special, and even our four guests couldn't agree whether or not the UCP, <laughs> and for that matter, the NDP, even wants this to be an election issue. Uh, in my mind, it obviously is an election issue, like it or not. Uh, could this deal, uh, the way that it was reached, some of the secrecy around it, could it, could it blow up in the party's face? I think it's a good deal, right? I mean, as much as the NDP wants to say there was no details, there was elaborate details. And as you mentioned, I was in the premier's office when she first took off, uh, took took office. And this is something we've been talking about the entire time. Within the first couple of weeks, she asked Rick McIver to, you know, explore this. Rebecca Schultz is obviously the Minister of Municipal Affairs, but also a Calgary MLA um, to, to look at this opportunity. She's talked about it in numerous speeches over the last seven months. Um, and and even said as recently, you know, at a at a event in Calgary that there was it was close to to happening. So when you have, I don't think it's fair as a provincial government when you have fifth like unanimous support, fifteen out of fifteen of your councillors wanting it coming to the table, the NHL coming to the table, and the government coming, you know, a little bit less than that, but coming to the table to support something. I think we can agree. I mean, I live in Edmonton. I would love to have an entertainment complex where. For example, on Friday, Shania Twain could be in Calgary um, because it can't be, it's, it's not equipped here. Um, I'm very excited about it. I think, you know, whether it's it's seen as a good or a bad thing, I think that it's something that needed to happen. And, uh, you know, the, the government wanted to go ahead with it before because it sounds like Rachel would kill the deal. So uh, let's get it moving and the planning going forward. Cheryl, I, I I would love for you to disclose whatever you're willing to about, about what the conversations have been like in your party's war room, because uh, uh, Rachel Notley is in a bit of a conundrum here. Uh, if she says she hates the deal, her opponents can paint her a certain way as an enemy of hockey in Calgary. And if she says she loves the deal, well, you know how that flies, especially with people that are critical about public money going to infrastructure projects like this. Uh, what's the scuttle but been what's the strategy session been like well anyone who knows rachel notley knows that she is intensely practical and she likes to have all the details of anything in front of her you know she is a, she's a lawyer she likes to have any, all of the details of anything in front of her before she makes a decision and i think we can all agree an arena project an event center in in calgary's core is a really really exciting opportunity. It could be an amazing opportunity to bring vibrancy back down to the core, which we all know Calgary needs right now. Um, but but if we look at what we know so far, the cost of the project has doubled in recent years. The, the public contribution has tripled in recent years. I know, Erica, there are details out there, but really important ones, like who will pay for the cost overruns, that stuff is not public. And it's really, to do our due diligence to say, before we commit to this, we just need to see what, you know, the devil's in the details. We need to see who's paying for what and who's on the hook for what. And if there's any additional exposure to taxpayers, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. Eric, you want to respond? Ryan, I, I'd love to jump in here. Yeah, I just I just want to say, like, you know, I, I appreciate due diligence. I appreciate wanting to see all the details. It's quite kind of funny that you say that, though, because, um, you know, your party's announced $40 million to to a new stallery. I think everyone agrees, uh, you know, the goal is to find a standalone stallery home for uh, children's health. But, you know, you just threw money at the the wall, like, and you've been government. If this was 2015, I'd be like, well, okay, like they just don't understand that there's planning and design and feasibility studies, et cetera, which is all going through the process right now. So if you're talking about a leader wanting due diligence, I, I think it's really hypocritical to go and then throw $40 million when that hasn't been assessed because the it was in the budget to go through the, the mechanisms in 2023. 20, uh, and that's not even a decision with a number value uh, until after this election. So I just think it's like, I'd love to hear what you have to say about, you know, throwing that or, or having a downtown campus where you're going to give $125 million um, to, to downtown 
Calgary for a campus when there hasn't even been a, a request from a capital plan? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is an important thing because this is what all Calgarians and really Albertans are weighing. And although both, you know, any infrastructure project in Calgary is an exciting project, but I don't think anyone will say that it's the same to hold up the Stollery Children's Hospital, which is responsible for saving the lives of our children and keeping them healthy against a, an arena. Like they're both really exciting projects, um, but we don't have a choice but to take care of our children. But she can't say that she's waiting for details on one and then be not looking for details like it's about who she is and like what kind of you said she's she's a thorough individual respectful of that completely but like how can you say that she's she looks through a microscope or or assesses a, a deal versus a political win that uh, on a children's hospital right like i just want to yeah, get clarity I think when it's a, like that. when it's a a private deal i think there is a little bit more diligence to do in terms of who's earning the revenue this is a this is a revenue generating project. Who's earning the revenue and who is responsible for the cost overruns? Those are those are details that do not play a role in when we build a, a hospital to take care of sick kids. But they are really important when we think about who's making the public contributions and at what level for a project. Like I said, very exciting project, but those details are important. Let me jump in here. So what and you're saying is details are important when you want them to be important, just to be clear. No, when the taxpayers on the hook for revenues and cost overshares, like when we're talking about who's making the money off of this and who's paying for it, those are really important when we're talking about a private, uh, a private deal. The Stollery Children's Hospital but, but economic is not going to make money. Back to everyone. But okay. economic impact and and the feasibility comes back, like the the benefit comes back to Calgarians as well. So, yeah, and I think I, looking I, at I what that benefit comment, is is really important. Okay, yeah, let's, let's talk about the, the economy. Is. Let's let's zoom out and talk bigger picture about the economy. Um, Cheryl, a, a couple of weeks ago, welcomed a longtime political pundit, opinion columnist Leisha Corbella to the show, and she says there is no way that Rachel Notley can campaign on her record as premier in the context of the <laughs> economy. What would you have said to Leisha if you were speaking with her uh, like you are with Erica right now? Well, I'll say I'm sure uh, Erica will be happy to raise the same point. So I will just answer both of them right now and say, um, listen, it is it's easy. It's much easier. I won't say it's easy. It's much easier to uh, point to jobs created and point to um, a surplus when times are good. When oil's, you know, sitting up over 100 bucks a barrel, it's much easier to do that job. But what we should be looking at is how do governments manage this in the tough times? Because um, if we look at our record, like, yeah, we had $4 billion in royalty revenues to work with when we were in government. The UCP had $27 billion last year. Like a squirrel running across a keyboard could balance that budget. I'm not sure it's something that they want to hang their hat on. Like, this is the easy stuff. What do we do when times get tough? And where do we see those cuts? When, when, like if, say if the UCP is in power, where do we see those cuts and where will Albertans feel it first? Erica, you want to pick up on this? I mean, like, like so, uh, well, I mean, I get, I, uh, oh, now all of a yeah. sudden you guys want focused questions from me. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so, 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 so I mean, the, the plain we'll question is going to be, combo, uh, uh, no, which is, hey, that's we'll perfectly fine. We'll let you know fine. when we need you. No, you, you don't need me at all. I can just read the ads at the end. That's totally fine. And I'm being serious. Uh, but, but I mean, the number one question at the door for people that want details, I mean, people want details on everything. It's the way that we're wired. People's vote means yeah. everything. Thing to them it's it, it's it's a big deal when you choose who you're going to vote for and people will say well why are the united conservatives the best choice for alberta's economy everybody sort of has these things and, and you two both know how it goes everybody goes well if the election's about the economy it's going to be the ucp and if the election's about health care it's going to be the ndp but erica why if the devil's in the details why is the ucp the best choice for alberta's economy so now that we've asked you for a question, I'm going to kind of ignore it first, and then I'll come back. You do you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, no, I mean, uh, Cheryl said something that was, you know, about times were tough. Well, the UCP also inherited $70 billion of, of NDP debt. So it's not easy paying down someone else's debt. Um, so I wouldn't say that we had a PC walk started that debt. And I'm not disagreeing that it wasn't accumulated, but you alone in your four years uh, had $70 billion dollars, which is the amount of an, an annual budget. So it's not a small amount um, that the United Conservative Party had to, you know, work to get the fiscal house in order. Um, I think the biggest thing is not only who can manage your economy from, or your manage your budget from year over year, because Sir Rachel's 
uh, or to, sorry, Cheryl's point, um, there are ebbs and flows in the economy. We have good years where we're able to have a surplus and put things into the heritage fund like we have uh, done this last year. But it is about living within your means, right? We wouldn't be able to invest another billion dollars in health care like we did this year if it wasn't for the amount um, of savings and smart spending that we had put um, forward and paying down debt, right? Like Albertans don't want their grandkids to have to pay for the debt that they incurred today. That's just like not a reality. So I think that's one thing that when it comes to why the UCP, one, they're doing a long um, fiscal framework that's going to keep our house in order, not just this year uh, where we can, we're fortunate enough to have a surplus, but year over year, putting a mechanism in place where um, part, uh, governments are required to balance a budget. And if they have to go into a deficit, they have a plan, plan, to, plan to pay it back. Like, I mean, we all do it in our household budgets. Why shouldn't your government? Um, if you incurred that because, you know, you're buying a house or you're, you know, in a tough financial spot, you always want to get into the black. And that's what the government is working towards. Um, if it comes to job, on this rate, point, like, job killing, we all know who- This is where, uh, we, this is where we agree, though. Rachel us. Notley has said that she's committed to balanced budget. She, uh, we've laid out a fiscal plan that talks about, uh, you know, how much we should be putting into the Heritage Savings Trust Fund, how much should be going to debt. And the fact that, I mean, Erica, yes, you guys, you guys did balance the budget. But like I said, it's easy to do when you have $27 billion in revenue. Um, Rachel Notley has not also committed though? to funding public health care and funding public education. And as we have these highs no in our royalty revenues, that's really important to us. All- as well. And I think the UCP has fallen short there. But you don't get to do that when you don't get to do all those wonderful things. We agree. We we believe in public health care. We believe in supporting public education. We are all about supporting services. And we're fine too. But how do you fund it when you're chasing businesses out? Like we have a corporate tax rate that welcomes investment at 8%. But where it's resulted in no new jobs and no new investment in four years. We have 40 time, 42 times the amount you brought in of net new private sector jobs. That's like not even, that, that's a, a huge number. That's a but huge amount of increase for that. in jobs. Like yeah. we're talking about ebbs and flows. We don't in the take economy. credit for the economy, but we, we take credit for creating an environment that is, uh, you know, appetizing. So if you let's talk about corporate tax or cost of living. Because what I've heard from businesses is that it's not, it doesn't just come down to taxes. It comes down to certainty. Businesses want to know that they have regulatory certainty and that they can know what to expect from their government. And what does not offer them certainty is things like the Sovereignty Act or things like a leader who flip flops from the from the morning to the evening and accommodates whatever position suits her best that day. That does not offer businesses certainty. That is the opposite of certainty. This is an example, actually, where Danielle Smith campaigned on a Sovereignty Act, talked to her caucus, found a good spot. That's also, I've been talking to a bunch of businesses, especially as the Sovereignty Act was rolling out. And once they understand that it's simply for us to stand up against Ottawa, there's a lot of Alberta businesses that are okay with that because we do have a great opportunity with uh, 8% corporate tax um, we are now off like lowering uh, or a reelected UCP government would uh, put, you know, lower personal income tax. When people and businesses move here, they're not just looking at the corporate tax or what it would cost them. They're also looking at cost of living. They're looking at, you know, do they have um, great environments to bring their families? And we have a family all we've doctor. done in the last four years. We, yeah. And, and we have said that numerous times. I'm more than happy to scream and shout that I, we have said I think, that like, we in will addition never to make someone pay for a family doctor. In addition to the Sovereignty Act, we have seen Daniel Smith has had a relatively short time in office compared to other people. We have seen in her very short time that she's an opportunist. She's willing to change her positions. She's willing to break her promises. She's willing to outright lie when it suits her best. She's proposed a whole bunch of things, like you said, that she ran on, like bringing in a costly provincial police force, like bringing CPP, taking Alberta out of CPP and risking our pensions. Those things are things she's not talking about now, and she's not going to talk about them until she's elected. Albertans are feeling today that they can't trust Danielle Smith, and they're feeling that way for good reason. Well, I, and I, I, I will highlight some of those points. Um, 
specifically on what she said. So when you run in a leadership, um, you do find ways that you campaign. Then you become a part of a team, exactly what Danielle Smith did. She became, you know, the captain, but she's still a team team member. She's changed some of her, you know, refined some of her positions because she talked to her team. She worked with the team. She didn't dictate exactly how this was all going to go. She learned from her caucus who were talking to Albertans and 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 shifted on some of the things she she campaigned on. I think that's great leadership. I haven't I don't seen know her walk some- back any of those things. She's just gone quiet on them. She has not committed not to not to make people see a family doctor, not to pay to see a family doctor. She has not disavowed those comments that she's been making for months and written full reports on. She has not said that she won't pull us out of CPP and she has not walked back from the provincial police force. Going quiet is not the same thing as changing your position. So those are also things. So to come back, yeah, she has been in office for a short term, but the United Conservative Party um, that got a mandate from Albertans in 2019, you know, a lot of those things, the fair deal was panel proposed some of those things to be looked at just because there's not all of the evidence. They've said that the pension plan is going to refinement for a report to come back to government. Why would you assume the answer when you have smarter people than all of us? I don't have to assume the answer. She's openly mused about it. She's openly talked about it. Like these aren't things that I'm making up. She hasn't committed either way. And she's also said said it's a referendum. These are things that Daniel Smith has said publicly. And she hasn't walked them back. And there is no trust from Albertans that the day that she's elected to office, she won't do whatever she wants for the next four years. That's what people are worried about. She has a caucus that she listens to. She has a team. She has advisors. Like, I think maybe, I don't know how your caucus works, but our leader listens to her caucus and her teams and consults. Um, she's not going to she, make a decision. I mean, she listens to a different person together. every day. She changes her opinion every Rachel day. If she gets different information, I think that's fair for all of us to, like you said, admit you're wrong, but you said it was a quality that that Rachel does and your party does. I think if we do it, we should also get the same credit um, that admit that it's not the right path. If you say that, um, you know, we you want to have like Rachel wants to see an arena deal and see all the details. Well, if, if the premier says she wants to see all the details on what this would look like for Albertans and then take it to Albertans. It's not her sole decision. She said that. She said it's going to go like, to okay. Albertans. So I've heard, I don't know how that's unfair. Tell me if I'm wrong here. I have heard that Daniel Smith is making very, very few public appearances throughout the campaign, that she's got like a handful of them, but mostly she's not going to be speaking publicly and not taking questions from media. I think that Albertans should be worried that on day two of the campaign, the UCP is so worried that Daniel Smith is going to say something wild that they put her into hiding. And I will say this, if the party cannot trust Daniel Smith for 28 days, how on earth could Albertans trust her for four years? I have no idea what you guys sit around and talk about to create these like <laughs> ridiculous comments. But, you know, two things. One, I've highlighted that we have a strong team. We're coming out every day with announcements, highlighting things. The premier will be up multiple times a week. I think it's a great thing that we're highlighting some of our candidates that are across the province to be able to drive our message. We don't rely solely on our leader. Um, I think that's a great demonstration of, of bench strength. I mean, the other thing is you guys put your leader up. She's up twice today. Is she going to make huge announcements? Because she was up for two weeks before and she said a lot of nothing. She did like Price is Right It's style. not about announcements. It's about accountability. It's about yeah, talking to the public to and events. taking questions from the public Carol, and being able to like, take we're a inside, position. We're inside baseball. We're inside baseball. And like, let's just be honest with people. You don't win more votes going up into media than you do getting out to the community. You like, why would you not want to be certainly a don't win more votes hiding? You certainly but don't win more votes not. hiding. Just because she's not doing announcements and media availabilities every day doesn't mean she's not talking to rooms and like shaking hands with people. And, and I would be rolling that out up. an entire platform, a vision for Alberta. And it's important that there's accountability there, that she's held accountable, that she's questioned for her ideas, that she's asked where her position is on, is on important things like making to yeah. pay a, to see and a family doctor, she's up every other CTP, day the like police that, force. You know? Accountability matters. And not being, not making right. yourself available and to take those questions is hiding from that accountability. You can still have a statement. You can still talk to folks as required. I would say every single day, it's more important to get out in front of Albertans than stand in front of the both. microphone. I think you can do both. And you can. She is. Like, and you I think Daniel Smith should do both. She's not- 
Okay, it's Wednesday. And that's fair. I mean, in our campaign. It's it's uh, well, it's send Wednesday the message tomorrow. Along, please. <laughs> Tuesday, Tuesday today, Wednesday tomorrow, on Wednesday's Real Talk, uh, beloved country music star Cor Blund is going to join me uh, right here in the Real Talk studio, and there and and he hopes to, and, and if his track record uh, proves to be renewable, he will kickstart another conversation about coal exploration, coal mining in the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. It was obviously a story that enraged uh, people that would typically be very supportive, and, and I'm generalizing and painting with a big, broad paintbrush, but people that would typically be very supportive of a conservative government. That wasn't the case. It became a huge headache uh, for then-Premier <laughs> Jason Kenney. Erica, what guarantee uh, will the United Conservatives give Albertans around protecting the eastern slopes? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say that I don't think the government did this properly. They didn't consult properly when they first introduced it and, and it blew up in their face. Um, so they had to go back to the drawing board, back to consultation. And our government is very committed to looking at both the environmental impact that it would have and working with, you know, the consultants, people that are far smarter than me on, on how to approach this. But, you know, we're, we're finding a solution. And, you know, again, like we're writing the wrong that happened initially. Cheryl, uh, the NDP is obviously, Rachel Notley's t taking this one head on. She wants to, there to be a conversation around coal, and she's basically said, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that the party, if it forms government, would do everything it could to completely shut down coal mining in the Rockies. Flip side, what does that do to investor confidence in Alberta's energy industry, and, ha and how will she you know, ensure that that messaging rolls out properly to protect thousands of jobs in Alberta? Yeah, I mean, this this conversation where we say environmental protection and economic opportunities are pitted against each other means neither will be successful. First off on coal, what we've said is there will be no coal mining in the Rockies. That is the answer that Albertans want to hear. And that is what Rachel Notley said yesterday. And she will continue to say about this campaign. When it comes to economic development and, the, and support for our energy sector in this province, she's been very clear. The NDP is very supportive of energy in this province. It, this is an energy leader. We will continue to be now and into the future. But we need to take advantage of the opportunities that are, that are in front of us right now to leverage that investment that we're looking for. Um, there's billions of dollars in capital that is ready to come to Alberta and what we need to do to make ourselves a, a province that offers certainty, that offers incentives, that offers a real environment where we can continue to grow. And we're not looking backwards. We're actually looking forward to the opportunities that exist in front of us. Uh, we've so, already... Cheryl, when you say, oh, sorry, I'm just going to ignore Go you. Go ahead, again, Erica. Right? Yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, it's interesting that you say, um, you know, that you're creating an, an environment for, for people to come here. I mean, and that you support the energy sector, except a week ago, your leader said that, um, or it was resurfaced, uh, which I don't know if she's even commented on it, on a cap on the Alberta energy. So, you know, we all believe in diversification of our energy sector. We all believe that we should look at, you know, hydrogen, nuclear, the you know, all the opportunities that we, we can have to diversify solar, uh, et cetera. But, um, you know, how do you explain that? You're going to literally cap. Yeah, it's easy to explain it when you've you. taken it so far out of context. Albert, uh, Rachel was the first person, the first like provincial. Like a family doctor and having to pay for that. The first, <laughs> we'll get to that. The first provincial uh, leader who spoke out against the federal government's emissions cap was Rachel Notley. She has said that it doesn't work. It's not reasonable. It wouldn't actually meet our goals. What we have always said is that we need to work with the sector to decarbonize, to bring down our emissions and to make progress here. And when she talks about bringing down emissions, that's where everybody's at. If we want to be competitive, if we want to compete in this global market, we have to bring our emissions down. She has never said production cap. We have talked about an emissions cap and in the role in the uh, context, that the federal government has proposed it, she has always been very passionately opposed. Well, that's not what I'm hearing, but uh, I look forward to hearing more from her on how she's going to support the, the Alberta energy sector. Um, you know, I mean, she also didn't stand up on carbon tax. She hasn't, you know, come out with strong policies that make it a great place to want to do investment in Alberta. I mean, well, I like, think she has. We've we rolled out quite like a lot. She's, she's rolled out quite a um, robust job Best strategy, which, which in, includes the Alberta Incentive 
tax credit, which includes a huge boost, the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program. Those are the things that like when we look at whether our capital is going across the border to the United States or whether they're coming to Canada, not only do we want them to come to Canada, we want that investment to come to Alberta. And what that means is we have to layer on top incentives. And in December last year, Rachel rolled out a, a plan that was based on consultation with the energy sector and a, a diversity of businesses in terms of what will it take to get you here? And what they've said is what we talked about incentives, but also on top of all of that, none of the incentives matter unless we have regulatory and uh, legislative certainty. And we're offering that. Whereas on the other hand, the UCP is offering things like the Sovereignty Act and a leader that changes position every day. Those are the things that matter when we talk about attracting investment and attracting capital. And I think when you hold them up, it's a pretty easy choice. I, I do agree that, that um, you know, in introducing, you know, the process and incentives for businesses. I mean, TIER is a perfect example of giving uh, for your emission reduction, uh, giving credits back, giving credit, you know, rebates back to, to businesses. So once you've established, um, there's that. There's also, um, you know, this premier has come out a lot talking about emissions reduction, carbon neutrality, uh, all of the types of things that, uh, frankly, I think a lot of leaders across the province, regardless of ideology, are talking about now. Because you're right, it is a reality. We need to figure out how to get emissions down. This government has never said any different. Um, it is about carbon neutrality and finding Alberta solutions to make us you know, appealing as a um, government, uh, appealing as a province to do business in and, you know, highlighting all of our environmental uh, concerns and how we're going to address them. OK, I suspect I'm, I'm going to. Sorry, Cheryl, I'll let you wrap up your thought real quick. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. Neither of your teams are going to let me talk to you anymore because I've kept you 20 minutes. I know how these <laughs> days go. I know that your schedules are rigid, but I don't want to cut you off, Cheryl. I just wanted to say, like, like saying that we need to reduce our emissions and saying that we need to take action to be competitive in this global market and address climate change, that is one thing. But actually in introducing a plan with real steps that help us get there is a far different thing, and we haven't seen any of that from the UCP. Okay, in closing, and I appreciate both of your time, uh, that was Cheryl Lotes with the NDP campaign, Erica Baroudis with the UCP campaign. Uh, we, we saw something pretty remarkable uh, a very short time ago, a, a UCP candidate, Chelsea Petrovic, issuing an apology ahead of a scandal. Uh, she's getting ahead of <laughs> something. We don't know what yet. Uh, but she says, as somebody who's used social media since I was a teenager, I have many old posts I'm not proud of. You know, she talks about how she used humor to deal with trauma or high stress environments using crude, inappropriate language, had no intention of ever seeking public life. There's comments she knows she should have been more prudent. She regrets not researching the topics. She wants to apologize unreservedly for any hurt she has caused. I actually think, and, and I don't know what the comments are and I don't know what the posts are, but personally, I think that this is actually a really positive development in politics. And, and I actually quite like this. But it is remarkable for something like this to happen during a campaign. And so I have different questions for both of you, obviously. Number one, Cheryl, to you, what on earth does the NDP have on Chelsea Petrovic? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I would actually love to know what she's been deleting off her social media feeds over the last few months that she's worried about. I agree. I think... Ryan, you're right. It is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great thing when you see not only those running for public office, but anybody to say, you know, I've made a mistake and I own it. I think here it's a little disingenuous to own something without offering any details on uh, what's happened in the first place and how her positions have changed since then. So to, to expect that as the details of this roll out, that she will somehow be uh, forgiven for them in advance, I think is a bit of a stretch, but I agree. The sentiment, the idea that someone would come out and apologize uh, for past mistakes, I think is fine. Um, we just need to know what she's apologizing for. Yeah, Erica, was was this apology something that was requested or, or, or demanded uh, by the party leader, or was this the candidate's decision? Yeah, I mean, it's from Chelsea. Chelsea, I think, wants to address anything that could impact the campaign or her family, um, anything like that. And, and I think we should just commend her. I don't, don't think we see enough of this in politics. And I would commend someone on the NDP if if they came out and, and did this too. So I think it's actually a positive thing for, for politics to see people have ownership, be humble, uh, try and bring clarity to, to potentially some stuff that could be misconstrued. Um, so I, I think it's a good step and you got to have someone to start this change. So 
Um, I, I look forward to to maybe some NDP people apologizing for what they've done in the past too. Well, well and hey, just to, to to now take this, there's no question coming here, and and we'll wrap. I know you both have places to be and things to do, but 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 what it does is it actually it takes some power away. Uh, from other strategies as well. It takes the power away from the NDP, right? I mean, you know, if, 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 if all of a sudden the UCP candidate says that, well, I, I apologize and I apologize for everything unreservedly, then you can't, then, then it goes both ways, right? And so it almost took ammunition away from both parties in a way, which is kind of interesting. But does, and- it, but does it, Ryan, because it, is it fair to say, like if I say, you know, right now, I apologize unreservedly for everything I've ever said and done, if it was offensive, or if I should have learned more, or if I, you know, was too young and hadn't thought about it. I don't think that's quite as gen- as uh, genuine as it would be to say, you know, at this point in time, at this point in my life, I did X, and this is how I've learned from it. And this is why my, my position is different. Like, that's an apology. Yeah, that's I guess. But I mean, you know, and, 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 and but to say if I had to go on the record and give a, a specific apology for all of the dumb things I've done through my life, <laughs> it would be like a four hour podcast. It would just be like a it would be like a stock Aww. ticker. And I would just, we you know, can't just all give blanket apologies and expect to be blanket forgiven for everything in the future. Well, I- yeah, and Cheryl, I, I would say, like, I think that we, like, I don't want to take away from what I believe to be positive for her to come out and, and issue this. But I mean, if, if we're talking about issues, and I'm going to get my last punch in, um, is, you know, you have a bunch of candidates that have come out anti-police, trying to cut police budgets, trying to not support them. And we've actually even called on your leader to to apologize for that. And we've heard nothing. So, um, I mean, that's a perfect example of an issue that you might just want to say, you know what, at the time it was emotional or I didn't mean it, or in hindsight, I wouldn't have said it and apologize, but we've heard crickets from you guys. So if we want to take an issue that's been uh, asked for clarification, I, I think you guys have some in your camp. <laughs> okay, Cheryl, last word to you. Inter- whether the public's asking for clarification or whether it's just a UCP campaign fear mongering and spinning. Um, and in the cases where the public actually is worried about a previous comment or the public is worried about the position of a leader, what's different about the NDP is Rachel's very clear in her position. Her position will be the same in the morning as it is in the evening. And she is principled. And there are positions that she's stuck to for the last 15 minutes, the last 15 years. They are things that she is grounded in. Albertans can count on that. And where we need to apologize where we need to clarify, we absolutely will. That is uh, Cheryl Oates, a senior advisor to the NDP campaign, and uh, Erica Barudis joining us, uh, a senior advisor on the United Conservative campaign. Much respect to both of you. Thanks for putting it out there, and, and, and thanks for giving us a lot to think about on this episode, day two of the campaigns right here on Real Talk. We'll see you both again soon. Thanks. Okay, Real Talkers. Now it's over to you. Uh, how did that, uh, Johnny? You, I just looked over and you just got this. Like this, this is like you. You were giving me eye contact that was just like no. It's stay great. out. Of, you were telling me stay out of the way. It's great, but this. I think this just it shows how the political landscape is right now in Alberta. And I threw that up. That voter intention. It was like a month and a half old. We don't have the latest data, but how close this race is going to be? How close all the issues are? And I personally. Right now, would just like to come out, Ryan, and apologize for everything that I've done my entire life. In kindergarten, I tripped a girl who was running in the schoolyard. Uh, I remember in grade two, I stole six dollars from my mom's purse to buy comic books. I'll get a list up, but I'll throw it up on grade the Real two, Talk website. You stole six dollars with inflation. That's I, like stealing a hundred bucks. It, I felt horrible about it. But did I, you get I, busted? Or did you confess? I, I did, and I ha- I had to get those Spider-Man comics. But uh, I want to get ahead. Which of are now th- worth three hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I want to get ahead of everything I've done in my life i'll make a comprehensive list it's it's and i talked about this with charles adler yesterday as well if you if you're just joining us if this is the first episode of real talk that you've heard this week or maybe ever uh check out yesterday's episode as well with chuck and we get into this and and i i i gotta say i mean i we haven't seen whatever she's talking about we don't know what it is it could be egregious it could be horrific in which case you'll go "Eh," right but if it's insensitive if it's abrasive and insensitive and uninformed, well, it must- if it's immature, John, I have a million examples. I have so many things I would take back. Mm-hmm. I have jokes I told that ring around in my ears that I'm devastated that came out of my mouth. I'm embarrassed about so many words I used to to say and so many dismissive comments I would make. I mean, I was I was an ignorant, uninformed, inexperienced, naive asshole. 
And a lot of people would describe their teenage years or their early adult years as the same, Mm -hmm. where we're trying to be funny, but we're just stupid and we don't understand the power of our words and how they can hurt people. Mm -hmm. And And then our walks of life take us to places where we travel to new lands and make new friends and understand new perspectives and new cultures and new traditions and histories and learn about our own nation's history and learn about the plight and the struggles and the fight and the courage shown by different communities. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this is how we grow. But hell yeah, I have a thousand things I would love to take back. And I admire the candidate for putting it out there. Sure. I do think Cheryl makes an interesting point. She'd like more specifics on exactly what she's talking about, but I don't think she's looking, the candidate is looking to give, uh, you know, the NDP cannon fodder like that. I do think it's also an interesting move if she did it, like Erica says, without the involvement of the party leader. Which not, could be not, something You know, we're not calling do. Danielle Smith the premier right now. She's the party leader, right? Uh, it, it puts their team in a tough spot because what if, like I alluded to earlier, what if the UCP war room was hanging on to something or holding something major, you know, a bomb they were going to drop about an NDP candidate a week before the election. Now they can't, right? Because one of their candidates has put this out there and said, listen, there's some stuff that may or may not come out that I'm not proud of. And now if that happens the other way, that party can just say, well, yeah, same as your candidate. You know, we apologize for everything. Is this what we do before every campaign? Just a blanket statement. But it it must be something bad. You wouldn't put that out. Like usually you you do it afterwards, right? You you deal with the, the smoke. After the fire has been lit, but it, there must be something that somebody emailed her about or that she came across herself in her past on her Facebook or whatever, where she's like, this could be damaging. Yeah. Right? Or, hey, maybe maybe we give her the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she's just having a gut check moment where she wants to, to be say, you know, here, here's all my cards on the table. Here's <laughs> the deal. Uh, and here's my perspective moving forward. You know what line I think was it was a was a big one in her statement. Uh, where she said, as someone who never, I, I'm not reading it, but, but off the top of my head, something like, as somebody who never endeavored uh, for a life in the public eye or public service, right? She says, as, as somebody who, who never uh, really basically had, had uh, you know, a career media. in mind yeah. uh, in public life, in public politics. And, and, and a lot of people can relate to that. And as we talk about who we want to, and I'm not, I'm not endorsing this candidate. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things about, about this candidate that, that are, you know, in, in my mind, I, I wouldn't see eye to eye on. My understanding is she's, she's tight with the Take Back Alberta movement. My understanding is, it's not verified, let me be clear, my understanding is that her husband was involved in the, the Coots blockade. My understanding is that she's an LPN, a healthcare worker that didn't want to get vaccinated, and, and perhaps that's motivating her desire to serve in provincial politics. We'll put it, we'll put it out and ask. We'll see if the party will... will We'll give her the green light to come talk to us. I'm happy to provide a fair and and objective venue to speak to this candidate. I would love to talk to her about this. Um, I don't know if she will, uh, but I'm just saying uh, many of us can relate to to that idea that, listen, when I was like 18, 19, 20, uh, I didn't know that I wanted to be an MLA or an MP or I didn't know that I wanted to be a school trustee. And so I didn't carry myself that way. That's most people. Right. And if, and if we want to talk about drawing the best possible people to politics, mm-hmm. I think we have to make uh, do what we can uh, to make that landscape a, a little bit less threatening. It's, it's, it's like asking somebody on the back of a boat if they want to jump into shark infested waters, if they want to put their name out there <laughs> to run for politics because people get eaten alive. People get burned at the stake. And I agree with you. I commend her for doing it, but it's not going to negate whatever comes out you know what i mean it might it i mean you can't just blanket statement i'm a politician now everything i've ever done like she still whatever happened and whatever comes out she's still gonna have to apologize and learn from it and show that she she's can say learned she from already it. did i mean if if you're holding uh and, and, you know if you're holding this bombshell facebook post or a comment whatever it was that we're talking about here maybe it's probably maybe a series of comments maybe it's just a period of time that she would like to take back but if you're holding that now can you even deploy that Mm -hmm. can you deploy that missile i don't know if you can she's already apologized i mean you know how does the public you gotta you gotta think about how the public will respond to this Mm -hmm. the public may say listen 
This candidate apologized. This candidate said she's not proud of this. This candidate promised to do better. What are you doing now? Why are you doing this? You know, are you trying to drag this down into the muck and mire? I mean, she, I, I think she took some of the power away. But uh, some things you can't apologize for. What if she said Austin Matthews was better than Connor McDavid? I mean, let's not be ridiculous. <laughs> I don't think that anybody... You know, I don't think that anybody would be that ridiculous. I mean, I know we see some ridiculous. <laughs> All right, we got our guests waiting. We've, I, I, I have. These guests have been so patiently They've waiting. They've been polite, yeah. They have been so politely waiting, and I'm really looking forward to talking to the team from Kids Cottage. They're doing incredibly important work, and we're looking forward to that in just a quick second. I wanted to let you know that these conversations do not happen. Uh, simply put, they do not happen without sponsors like the J.R. Shaw School of Business at Nate, and here's why we're excited to talk to you about them because they're one of Canada's leading polytech business advisors and educators here. Here's what they do. They harness your inner talent. They help you build your skills and they feed your curiosity. So if you're listening right now and you have dreams to build the next innovative product, like your brain never shuts off, you're lying in bed and you're just thinking and thinking and scheming and dreaming. Maybe you want to solve a world problem. Maybe you want to lead change or grow community or transform business. Nate's J.R. Shaw School of Business is your answer. You can specialize in accounting, data analytics, entrepreneurship, innovation, finance, hospitality management, HR management. I love this. Marketing. You can check out more. Get down to business today with Nate's J.R. Shaw School of Business at nate.ca slash business. Hey, we're, we're just a short time away from Northwest Fest and uh, their lineup is unbelievable this year, including the Lebanese Burger Mafia. Yeah, that's right. This is the Northwest Fest International Documentary Festival. Proud to be screening this stranger than fiction made in Edmonton story of the legendary Burger Baron restaurant chain. This is straight from its triumphant world premiere at Hot Dogs. It's going to be an amazing hometown premiere with all of the filmmakers in attendance. This is just one of the films you can check out. There's also Black Barbie, a documentary, a look at the cultural impact of Mattel's first non-white Barbie doll. Adaptation, a look at wheelchair-bound athletes participating in the BC Summer Race Series. And of course, on opening night, still a Michael J. Fox movie. You can learn more about Northwest Fest at northwestfest.ca. It's coming up quick. And that's this weekend. We're going to be telling you about more of the feature films coming up right here on Real Talk. Hey, how many of you made it out to Friesen Brothers yesterday? 15% off on the first day of the month. I'm sorry if you're just hearing about it right now, the day after the fact. We do our best to keep it on your radar. Make sure you make a plan to be there June 1st. In the meantime, there's great news. Their family experiences flyer, the family essentials flyer rather, gives us great meal experiences, quality food for low prices every day. You can view the flyer online today at Friesen.com. That's F-R-E-S-O-N.com. So cool this weekend, by the way, to hang out with California Closets President Cameron Johnson. He was the fearless captain on our Cali Crush hockey team at the Alzheimer's Pro-Am. We're so proud to have contributed to more than $1.4 million in fundraising. California Closets is doing amazing work reinventing spaces and really adding value to where people live and sometimes in a home office context where they work. It was a good friend of Real Talk, Dustin and Amy. The Johnner family needed to turn a home office into a, well, an immediately available guest room. And look at this Murphy bed. We're showing those of you on YouTube the installation that California Closets did. You don't even have to take the stuff off the shelves when you put the bed down. How cool is that? Uh, by the way, Dustin told us these are details everybody cares about. He said this came in at $3,000 less than a competing closet company three thousand dollars less than the installation was done in one day you can get your free consultation today by visiting californiaclosets.ca 
And a big shout out to our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Did you notice the welcome home in our freezer for you, John? Did you did you notice saw, the welcome yeah. back to work? Yeah, our <laughs> freezer's all loaded up with dairy-free dilly bars, chocolate Woo! dilly bars, buster bars, you name it. A perfect grab-and-go treat from the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. Hey, this Mother's Day, what's your plan? Give mom the sweetest gift. Mother's Day cakes are back and ready to make mom's day. Uh, you can check these out at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Well, it's always kind of a, an unusual move to, to kick off an interview with an apology. Uh, but that's what we're going to do right now, because if it's called real talk, well, then you better keep it real. And the fact of the matter is that political debate went way longer than we thought it was going to. But we didn't want to stand in the way. And that means that we kept Janine Fraser and we kept Troy Shalafu waiting for a, a hell of a lot longer than we told them they'd be waiting. Uh, both of them have uh, dedicated a great degree of their efforts and, and a great deal of their personal passions to the Kids Cottage Foundation, which we're proud to talk about today. To the both of you, I profusely apologize for leaving you sitting there thank you so much for joining us this morning no worries thank you for having us <laughs> Troy you got a smile on your face so I'm, gl- I'm glad <laughs> you're not too ticked off with me I appreciate that <laughs> no no it's all good <laughs> so Thanks you're a board member us. Troy you bet it and Janine you're the executive director you are that you're the Edmonton area's only uh, crisis shelter for infants and children. This is obviously serious business that we're talking about. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with Kids Cottage, the Kids Cottage Foundation, what are you all about? When did this thing get started and, and, and what, what are the services and the needs looking like right now? Well, I can tell you um, a snapshot about Kids Cottage, which is we are, as you said, Edmonton's only crisis shelter, emergency shelter for children. We've been in operation for 30 years. So we're very proud of that and proud of um, the experiences and the differences we've had to make or we do make. Um, For all intents and purposes, it's just as it sounds. It's a shelter for children from newborn to 10 years of age. Um, We shelter just the children. And the reason why we're sheltering these children is because they are exposed to trauma, crisis, homelessness, um, food insecurity, anything you can think of. And our role and our, our vision is to ensure that children are safe from whatever it is that they're being exposed to. And all the while working with their families at the same time. I know it's very difficult for people to believe that we actually have homeless newborns on the streets of Edmonton. Um, We have children who have gone without food for many days, but that is the reality. And these are our community's children. Troy, how did you get involved with the foundation? I was uh, asked to to join the board about uh, close to 20 years ago. And um, it's been, um, it's been an honor to be a part of it just simply because of the, the weight of the work that we do, and we do it quietly. Uh, we, we do have our events that uh, create awareness, um, and we do work with uh, governments to raise our funds to do it, but we generally do it quietly. And one of the things that, we, we've, that I've, I've uh, been particularly fond of is the way that we hold events to create awareness. And we don't always, we don't always know how to gauge what the level of awareness is in the communities, specifically among people who need our services. And so we do a lot to promote um, our existence, Uh, but we never, you know, do these people know that they have a place to come to? Every year there's fatalities of children uh, die in in their own home, uh, occasionally at the hands of their own caregivers or parents. And we wonder ourselves on the board, did they know about us? Did they, did they have an opportunity to reach out? Could we have made the difference? And uh, sadly, we're reminded of that frequently. Um, just this week, we got another reminder. Mm. How, how do you, uh, how do you, I don't even know how to ask the question. I mean, you know, Janine, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, this, this is a team and, and, and I would imagine in particular, I mean, everybody involved, but in particular, the, the frontline workers. Uh, yeah. th- this is some of the heaviest emotional lifting that a person can do. 
Um, how, how is all of that? I mean, how does that happen? Uh, you, can, you can tell I'm stammering. I barely know how to ask the question because I'm, I'm thinking about yeah. my own newborn at home, to be honest with you. You've got a, an 11-month-old at home that I'm thinking about right now. Yeah. So an incredible team over the crisis nursery. I cannot say enough. And you're right. They are dealing with some of the most heaviest um, stories and experiences. We have a crisis line that runs 24-7, 365 days a year. My hat's off to the crisis line workers. Our crisis line is up in calls by 80%. It takes a whole team of individuals that are at the crisis nursery. It's from our intake worker crisis line, our follow-up worker that starts to work with those families right away to ensure that we're working with them and giving them the support that they may need in the community and sheltering the children at the same time. And knowing that these children are have been exposed to things that a child's brain is not wired to handle or manage. And that takes a whole team that is highly trained to work with those children. We never know who's going to see these interviews on YouTube. We never know who's going to hear the podcast. So I'll let people know that the crisis line uh, is 780-944-2888. And you can check out kidscottage.org uh, with with K's, a cottage with a K, kidscottage.org. Uh, Troy, you know, we're talking about right now election campaigns. I mean, this show is going politics heavy. We're talking about things like financial promises and we're, we're talking about uh, funding and we're talking about social services and holistic health care and public safety and all the things. Um, in the context of your role as a board member here, what would you like to see from candidates and where are some of the areas of greatest need? Well, I, th I think for us, uh, it, of course, we have to pay attention to to where and from whom the decisions are being made. But uh, we do we do need to maintain some sort of balance in how we engage governments. We definitely pay attention. We absolutely want to see candidates that place a high priority on the safety of children, and um, we are not the only. Uh, organization that that cares for families and, and children, but our unique uh, situation is is such that um, we have a high imp economic impact on cities and provincial governments to care for their citizens. We bear the brunt of uh, a lot of that financially through the, the private fundraising that we do, and government contributions only account for. For some of it, uh, Janine, how's and, oh sorry, Trey. Uh, well, I was gonna say the reality is is nobody, uh, nobody in our society is immune from crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of us, particularly all of us on this this call, we have a network of support. Um, ours is very uniquely dedicated to working with uh, small children uh, in situations of crisis. So there's just there's not a lot of that happening out in our help agency world so we require a unique uh, level of support and so we appreciate um regardless of who sees your your podcast ryan i think it, uh, this type of exposure is good for us but we we really do uh encourage we work with all levels of government and constantly that's one of the things that janine uh, has, has been very dedicated and successful at is building those relationships. And it doesn't matter what their stripes are. Um, I'm confident that we do live in a society that does place a high value on the safety of families and children, but not all levels of government approach it the same way. And mm. we can't control that, but through through uh, persuasive advocacy, hopefully we can get the right attention and the right support on an ongoing basis. Yeah, it's uh, and, and Troy, just to be clear, I wasn't expecting nor, uh, you to get partisan or to pick a team or anything like that. I think, you know, we, you know, someone would pull the plug on your laptop if that was about to happen, I'm sure, because that's the thing about these nonprofits and, and agencies like this is, yeah. is you do have to deal with politicians of all stripes. You do have to navigate different and, and choppy waters uh, oftentimes, especially when the economy dips. Um, Janine, is, is the story of Kids Cottage the same as, as so many others? I don't want to make any assumptions. 
assumptions, but but through oh, yeah. through COVID and in the last few years, need <laughs> has gone way up, and oftentimes resources, including finances, have kind of stalled out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the demand for our services. I mean, our crisis line alone, as I said, is up by eighty percent. Um, the children, the infants, and and the very young children that are coming in to see us and be sheltered um, are experiencing um, just such multi-complex layers of need, of trauma and abuse and homelessness and poverty. And um, so it's taking more staff, like it's it's requiring more staff to work with these children to ensure that these children are getting exactly what we need for them to have to grow up and to know that the world is okay and safe. So we know, you know, the first 24 months of a brain child's brain development is crucial. Um, And that's why there's an urgency, a sense of urgency for us to work with those children, the very young, as soon as possible. Janine, eighty percent is is a like a, a, a dramatic increase to state the very obvious. What I mean, I'm sure it's a number of contributing factors, but what do you think it is? Uh, I think it, like you said, it is a number of contributing factors during COVID, during lockdowns, chill, and we knew we would see this, but I don't think we really could con- conceptualize or grasp the the level or the acuity of of trauma that children are going through. So children who would have been um, had intervention services didn't receive the intervention services they required. Families who required those intervention services didn't receive that. Then you add another compounding factor, which is the rate of inflation and financial crisis. And these families are, are struggling to be able to survive. So it's just, there's so many compounding layers to why we're seeing what we're seeing today. Troy, if, if real talk audience members take one thing away from this conversation today, obviously we want to make sure that the kids cottage foundation is all over their radar and, and people that are uh, able to help uh, perhaps by way of a financial donation. Amazing for some people, it it could be a a life-saving connection. Uh, where they realize that resources are there where they need them most. What's the one thing that you hope people take away from this conversation? Well, I think that um, especially in light of all the attention that's going to be placed on the economy, I'd I'd like people to know that there's a very quiet war being waged against uh, the complacency in protecting children. Mm -hmm. And we need to ensure that People know that we exist to do that very thing. Our story is really told by the numbers. Uh, since we opened in '94, we have we have helped tens and tens of thousands of kids coming through our door, and that's a statistic that's sad to brag about, right? And the, our society, um, and like like many others, require this, and it is a battle, uh, and resources are required to to be able to to deal with these these emerging crises and it's just stacking layer upon layer um, as Janine's describing on the the final financial burden that it that it creates on our, our little society yet the financial impact uh, that it w- would be placed on just the city of Edmonton for example if we didn't exist would be mm-hmm. probably twenty one thousand dollars per child annually uh, impact. So we provide a service, an extremely but sadly required um, service. Yeah, that's a, that's a it's a very meaningful statistic and an important and relevant one, um, Troy. And I and I get why you mention it because it is relevant. But it's also like, and you're also like saving kids' lives. <laughs> We're talking about when you when you talk about infants. I mean, there's, there's mm-hmm. just this beautiful innocence of a child, or what we expect. Uh, should be the protected innocence of a child when you're talking about infants I don't know like I said it's just feeling very personal to me and I'm I'm just so grateful for the work Uh, Janine I do want to recognize that you were were recently honored uh, with the Queen Elizabeth uh, to the Platinum Jubilee Medal Uh, congratulations on that Um, obviously I think a reflection of the huge contributions that you're making in this community um, and for our community's most vulnerable Uh, I want to wrap with the same question that I gave Troy what's what's the the takeaway from here often you know a lot of people are going to listen to this on their commute on the 
bus, while they're walking their dogs, while they're on the Peloton. Uh, what do you want them to take away from this? What's the call to action? I think it's just as Troy said, the call to action is um, that, you know, it's, it's you know, maybe around 21,000 for very basic services. Um, whereas with Kids Cottage Foundation, you know, to shelter a child for three days, um, you know, is around $3,000. So you think about that, around $3,000 versus 21000 for very basic intervention. And so there's your return on investment. But not only that, it's also helping the families that are here. And um, we're working hard and strenuously to make sure that a child is not in a very, a baby is not in a very unsafe situation and that those families are protected. And that is the reality of it. That's Janine Fraser, uh, Executive Director, and also joined by Troy Shalif, who longtime board member at the Kids Cottage Foundation. Again, you can learn more at kidscottage.org. Uh, I do want to let people know as well, uh, I check out the events link here. You've got the Kids Cottage Gala coming up uh, in September, on September 29th of 2023. I, I'm a, I don't want to make any assumptions here. Uh, I don't know if it's sold out. Are there still tickets available? There are tickets available. Um, they're selling, which is so, we're so happy about Uh, because that means the community is supporting us and knows the work we do but yeah please um if you um are wanting a ticket make sure that you purchase one soon yeah it's gala season everybody's doing galas again this is a good thing uh now we want to see hundreds of thousands of dollars flying around in the right direction kidscottage.org is where you can learn more uh much love mad respect to both of you thanks for doing what you do thanks you so much ryan you bet uh johnny you know i think that that uh, quote I, before I quote it, I should know who says it. I don't know who says it, but it's that that idea, that premise of, of but by the grace of God, there go I. Mm-hmm. And you think of uh, you know children. It might be something obvious that I'm saying right now, but children that are born into crisis, um, and and you think of the parents. You know, you you, you, you to hear them referred to as caregivers uh, in many circumstances that maybe uh, living with or grappling with a mental illness or an addiction, a homelessness. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you imagine having nowhere to hang your hat? You, you've got no fixed address and you have an infant. Yeah. Um, and for a lot of these caregivers, um, obviously, I, I would be sure hundreds of different situations and different stories and, and different backgrounds and different things that got them to where they are. But in many circumstances, these are people that w- will be doing everything they can to protect these children, but just mm-hmm. don't have the resources they need. Um, and it's why we wanted to shine the spotlight on Kids Cottage. Happy yeah. to do it on the show. A couple angels there doing yeah, uh, work. So, yeah, share. Yeah. If you can't donate, at least share and uh, show the cause that they're putting all their efforts into every day. We really appreciate the attention of Real Talkers to this as well. We, we already know what's going to happen. Uh, we know that we're going to hear from the Kids Cottage Foundation at some point. And we know that they're going to let us know that somebody stepped up. Oftentimes, these are anonymous donations. Sometimes you let them know you heard about the story on Real Talk. Um, I can think of, you remember that animal shelter in southern Alberta? They came on to talk to us about their, their problem. We found out that somebody was yeah. just bestowing $5,000 donations to the animal shelter. It was a big shelters. donation was the next a big day. One. Yeah. Um, you, you could really make a huge impact on society's most vulnerable by supporting the Kids Cottage Foundation. That conversation was presented by our great friends at Kubi Energy who want you to know... They're hiring right now. They're heading into their busiest season, and uh, it's all hands on deck. So if somebody you know, or maybe it's you, is passionate about advancing Canada's energy industry while making a positive impact on the environment, Kubi would love to hear from you. You know, their CEO, the founding CEO, Jake Kubiski, was just out of their Kamloops office. He let me know the other day one of their installers came up to him, walked up to the CEO and said, I'm working here because I heard about Kubi on Real Talk. Amazing. I said, that is a great news. That's a praise report is what we call it. Kubi is Western Canada's busiest solar installer and they're now a licensed engineering company they're one of the only solar pv installers that are permitted to perform engineering through a pega that means you can rest assured their team of professional engineers electrical and structural ensure that all projects are completed to the highest of standard making your transition to renewable energy easy and stress-free you can connect with the company today at kubi energy you know, we partner with a lot of innovators and a lot of tech leaders and industry leaders on this show, and that includes the team at Apex Automation as well. 
and they're hiring too. This is good news, man. This is really good news Everyone's for tired. skilled professionals. Yeah. If you're fascinated by the field of automation, engineering, fabrication, you're going to want to take a look at apexautomation.ca today. Their quality is superior to their competitors. Well, how, you say? Well, they invest in labs in their office. You're seeing it right now on YouTube for testing all software and hardware before it's deployed to client sites. They bring the clients into the office for training to make sure that they understand that new software and hardware. They've even invested in building a shop for their team to stage hardware for robotics, electrical panels. Johnny, I was in there and I got to see an autonomous vehicle. Yeah. Uh, they were designing the software for it, and it's going to be going in and helping with mining operations for potash mm -hmm. mining. Fascinating stuff. This is all happening at Apex Automation. You know, we were proud yesterday to open the studio to Dr. Jared Wesley, political scientist. If you missed that conversation, make sure you check it out. Very first thing he says when he walks in, he goes, nice digs. I said, yeah, buddy, this place was built out by the team at Complete Care Restoration. And we're really excited uh, to be able to be in a position where we can give them a two thumbs up rating based on our personal experience. You know, if you're dealing with fire or flood in your home, mold or asbestos removal, you think you're going to mess around? No. You, you want to tipsy toe in the tulips? No. You want to deal with somebody you can trust to do it right the first time? You know you do. And that is Complete Care Restoration. We saw how they operate, and we give them my personal endorsement. You can give them a call today or put the number in your phone for when you need it. Hopefully never. But if you do, 780-454-0776. That's Complete Care Restoration. Coming up on Friday, we've got Trash Talk. We've already got like 15 submissions for Trash Talk. We're going to have to make some tough choices here. It's going to be politically driven, I think. <laughs> the writing's on the wall. It's presented, as always, by the team at Local Environmental Services. If you're a decision maker in a community in Alberta or Saskatchewan, wouldn't it sound good to deal with a no BS company? They literally have that up on the wall. No BS at Corporate HQ. <laughs> Fees, massive price increases. You're not going to see them jerking your chain. It's literally one of their core values, right? They understand the value of money spent in a local economy versus a non-local business. It's why they've been such great corporate citizens in Edmonton and area, White Court and area, Regina and area. You can learn more about how and why local environmental services is your full service environmental solutions partner at localenvironmental.ca. And if you're looking outside this time of year, inspired by the beautiful weather, you're starting to see, are you getting any buds on trees near your neck of the woods? Are you seeing any tulips popping up oh, quite yeah. yet? I can't wait to oh, tiptoe man. through them, Ryan. Hey, John, we don't <laughs> tiptoe through the tulips. We didn't come here to tiptoe in the tulips. There's nothing wrong with that. You know what I'm about to talk to you about. Eden Landscaping is bringing outdoor spaces to life, and tis the season right now. Their boots are already dusted off. The shovels are ready to rock. They're going to be breaking ground on projects starting, like, right now. If you want to make sure that your backyard, your front yard, realizes its full potential, and you're able to entertain for that special event later this summer, then today's a perfect day to get the ball rolling. Make contact with the custom landscape builder that's been earning referrals and return business for more than 20 years in Edmonton and area. It's Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. As mentioned, tomorrow's Real Talk is going to be one you will not want to miss. We make you the promise that we're going to cover this Alberta election from so many angles you forget some of them by the end of the month. Corb Lund, country music star, wants to make sure that coal is on our radar. That's mining on the eastern slopes. He's making the trip up to Edmonton to join me in studio. Plus, Curtis Stock on the Alberta connection to Secretariat, the 50th anniversary of the Triple Crown. That's coming up Wednesday. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John Hicks, General Manager Katie Cook Chivers, Account Coordinator Lawrence Durlego, Human Resources Lena Shepard, Website Design Mike Johnston, VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, 
Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a Relay Project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com. Oh,